Hello and welcome to the final episode of the week. It's the Friday episode, Stand Up Light. No news segment, no bells or whistles, just the guests, folks, just the interviews. And I just came out, back out, to the shed after hanging out with subscribers for, I guess it was like almost four hours. We went from like eight to midnight and I did uh, a little bit of drinking, as didn't see most people there. So I had to take a little nap and then come back out to just put this baby together. And by this baby, what do I mean? I've got great guests joining me today. It's Friday, and on Fridays, I'm joined by Christian Finnegan and Ophira Eisenberg, or O'Finnegan, as we are lovingly calling this segment now. And I should announce and also mention that January 15th, the three of us will be performing in King of Prussia. January 16th, we'll be in, uh, that's that's in Pennsylvania, of course, near Philly. Then we're headed over to Stone Harbor, the 16th, Sunday, the 16th of January. Stone Harbor, New Jersey. And then we will be in Beacon, New York, on the 22nd of January. So those are three dates. I'm announcing right now that the three of us will be performing together. I hope that you can come to one of them. And we'll be announcing more dates if we're able to sell tickets and, and these gigs work out, which I'm sure they will. So very excited to be with the two of them on the road and on today's episode. Also joined today by Gabby Goldstein, Dr. Gabby Goldstein of Sister District, which is a women-led grassroots organization that builds democratic power in state legislatures and fosters community and collaborative progressive policy transfer between state legislators. Gabby Goldstein joins me as well to talk about the future of Roe v. Wade, women's reproductive rights, and a great week of shows. I should thank CNN's Christine Romans, philosopher of science, Lee McIntyre joined me Monday. Glenn Kirshner and Tim Wise were on the show Tuesday. Wajahad Ali was Waj Wednesdays this week. Aaron David Miller, Dr. Aaron David Miller both joining me. And yesterday, Dr. Robert Jones and Liz Winstead. So a hell of a week of shows and news and guests and talks with you. And now it's time to get to the final show of the week. And don't forget to support my sponsor this week. It's givewell.org slash stand up. Please go consider giving a recurring donation or a donation that can be matched up to $250 right now to one of the most important charities you could ever possibly imagine because... They do all of the work and research to find out where your dollar is going to go the furthest. Givewell.org slash stand up. If you haven't done it this week, please consider signing up right now. Okay, speaking of right now, how about we get to the show, shall we? Christian Finnegan, a headlining comedian, tours the country. He has been on just about every single network and late night show and has a brand new stand-up special just out called Show Your Work. You should buy it now if you haven't already. And Ophira Eisenberg also has been headlining all over the country for a really long time now. She's the former host of NPR's Ask Me Another. She's a regular host and teller with The Moth, and her stories have been featured on The Moth Radio Hour and in two of The Moth's best-selling books, including the most recent New York Times bestseller, Occasional Magic, true stories about defying the impossible. The amazing Ophira Eisenberg, Christian Finnegan, join me together for what now is called Ophira again with a jingle soon to be produced hopefully next week by Gareth Sever. I know it's in the works at Christ Finnegan on Twitter at Ophira E on Twitter and Instagram as well and let's do it right now ladies and gentlemen it's time for O'Finnegan Ophira Eisenberg Christian Finnegan <laughs> this is the uh, the third <laughs> week in a row they've joined me I've just told you about our our dates we're going out on tour happy TGIF Fira Christian Thank you for joining me. I'm so excited that we're our, our, our new year in, includes touring. Dated breath. Yes. I mean, touring is such a misnomer for comedians. I mean, unless you are like literally going from city to city, it's like we're doing gigs. I think uh, it's great. So we're, we're, You're so right. We're headed I'll out. I'll do one show and someone will be like, where, are you on tour right now? And I'm like, as in, will I drive to somewhere else in the tri-state area this week? Probably. Yeah. Yes. Are you we're, on you know, the, uh, you, I'm just excited that we're going to be back out on the comedy circuit. Yeah, this, yeah. You, know, you know the circuit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you walk into a theater and you high five with the other people that are going the other way on the circuit. They're leaving. <laughs> exactly. You yes. come in. The and comedy you, autobahn, and you, <laughs> you stay in the same. 
You stay in the same condo that so and so just stayed in, and we all know who I'm talking about. Could be any oh, number. Oh, that so and so million people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. I don't know who you're thinking of, but we should just joke about the comedian we'd least like to follow the comedy condo in. Whoever that person <laughs> is. As a lady, uh, I always get asked now, "Would you prefer not to stay in the comedy condo?" And I almost always say, "That is correct." Yeah. I, yeah, I haven't. I feel like I've gotten super lucky. I haven't stayed in that many comedy condos. Uh, maybe because I give off an, uh, an effete preciousness that <laughs> you are. You seem fragile. Yeah. Let's, well, let's fragile. just explain. The comedy condo is basically maybe a three bedroom a condo or two bedroom apartment. Crash that, pad. That, yes. Yeah, that houses the comedians for the the long weekend or maybe sometimes a whole a whole week. And I haven't either, Christian. I've only done it, I think, twice. And it was not. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the club, I, I don't think they're as common as they used to be. I think because they got such a disgusting rep. But yeah, the idea is just that it's cheaper for a club to just rent a crappy apartment than it is to pay for hotel rooms every week. Yeah. May I say, though, when I went to Denver, this was back in August uh, and I was working with another comic who is huge and they were like, okay, the, the, the other comic refused the comedy condo, but will you take it? And I felt for whatever reason, I felt like I had to say yes. And let me tell you, it was a brand new condo in a luxury building. It was decorated like a children's playpen. I mean, that was whatever. Uh, but it had uh, a balcony looking at the mountains. There was an amazing gym and a hot tub. And I was hmm. like, <laughs> like yeah. it was the nicest place I've ever stayed. Yeah. So I mean, I was the, like, the, everyone, shh, quiet. <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. Hey, hey um, let me just tell you, Ophira. Um, every time you you're moving your microphone, and when you do oh. move it, it makes noise, and the oh. editor in me it, it screams out for relief. And so I throw back to you to say, what's the worst mic technique you've seen? a comedian what what is the the most annoying thing a comic does with the mic christian and ophir both of you please take that okay well i can tell you very clearly uh given that as my role as uh the husband of a venue owner Mm -hmm. um i've had to change out mic cords time after time after time because this is so annoying comedians who hold the microphone so that the cord bends at the juncture where it meets oh, the, the I never actual thought of that. It's the worst. I, I wish I could show an explanation of, because you'll see some people and they, I don't know if they want to give it sort of a Dick Cavett feel or something, but they'll, they'll almost hold the microphone like cone, like so that the, the base of the, the cord gets bent at like a 90 degree angle in their Ooh. hand and they'll, and it is something I see comedians do. It's always young male comedians. I think it's like the same vibe of the comedian who wants to sit on the stool because they think it makes them look casual or sort of like, it's like jazz, man. Um, and it fries microphone cords. And it's it's created so much work for me over the years, oh. having to string my cords through the ceiling of the venue because some open micer wanted to feel like, a jazz comedian. I uh, I I feel real uncomfortable right now because I've been experimenting with stool sitting lately. <laughs> uh oh. Listen, I feel like if you've done it long enough, you've earned it. I just see way too many like three year comedians try. That's to different. You're right. Force a feeling of casualness by like, I'll just sit down on the stool. I'm we're totally chatting. disagree. Totally disagree. Okay. Stand up. Wait, wait, wait a second. Isn't your show called Stand Up with Pete? Stand up on the stage, Pete. Yes. Oh, hmm. well, when, yeah. we, when the three of us are together, <laughs> I'm now going to purposely sit there so that the two of you who follow me can use it as as content to ridicule me for. It's fine. <laughs> OK, that sounds good. Thank I you. I do my entire Actually. act kneeling in a prayer position on stage. <laughs> uh, I'm in downward dog. <laughs> uh, this week, this coming week, you, <laughs> I just imagined that doing comedy in downward. Uh, th- this coming week, uh, uh, Ophira, you will be traveling to, to Portland, Oregon, all the way across the country on a, yeah. an airplane. And I'm, gonna, Chris, I'm so scared. Christian, you just recently uh, flew to Northern California for a gig mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. And so, you know, I haven't flown that far since pre pandemic. And, I want to know your your concerns about it, or maybe you should go first and tell her what she's in for, Christian. Have you done it yet, well, Ophira? The, the, wait, you went to Canada. I went to Vancouver, yes. Isn't that, Although, that's a long-ass flight. It was, yeah, it was, it felt too long. I mean, basically, 
yeah, after hour five or something, I was ready to throw, you know, a brick through the window. Um, but there was something there was, I don't know why, but sorry, Americans, but I was like, this flight is mostly Canadians. And so something (laughs) about it felt chilled out, but I will say that, uh, it was empty. It was an empty flight Mm. both ways. Well, I flew to Florida on Black Friday and uh, I was in, when I, flew to, when I flew to North Florida, when I flew to Northern California, I was in first class because of the corporate gig and they paid for it. So it was like a, a slightly nice. more genteel experience. But Florida, I was, you know, in with the, the hoi polloi. Yeah. And, uh, and? Um, and it was, it was annoying. I mean, I definitely, you know, as always, whatever, but whoever the biggest guy in the flight is will always end up seated next to me. Um, oh, but, the yeah. old the old like who's gonna sit beside me gamble as you oh, watch boy. every single person walk down the aisle and you're like no no oh, okay this good, might good, be good. this oh might, my god oh my god no this okay. might be where our world views clash again because i usually think like the hottest woman or a very connected guy that's going to help with me with my career is going to sit next to me and you guys apparently really? are, are, what? Both, are how do you, you think that way i manifest it <laughs> You have a seat half full mentality. <laughs> but does it happen? <laughs> Every time. No. I usually get a hand job. Really? Almost okay, always. Okay, you know what? From the biggest we're, guy on the planet. Biggest we're guy. We're going to put this to the test. I am going to start repeating continuously in my brain as a mantra until I leave job. on Monday that I will be sat beside someone who's going to radically help me yes. in some uh yeah. career personal whatever way you never know Thoughts and when you, when, you, when you think that way you tend to then maybe make a connection with that person and then that door opens up next thing you know you're doing a documentary about the arctic with them a documentary about the what? arctic are what? you microdosing what's going on with i you? sat next to a guy who was a documentary filmmaker and he asked me like maybe work with him on this thing it wasn't really a good opportunity wow. and it wasn't really a realistic thing That's but interesting it, but it was a fascinating he turned out, I turned out to interview him about another documentary that he had done and it was a great thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm see you now you're so. see, this is, you should write a, uh, Pete Dominic stand up with Pete Dominic, uh, inspirational book. Why? So you can shit oh, on I, it. I was going to say throw pillow. <laughs> yes. Throw <laughs> pillow or just one cross cross church <laughs> that is like specific to planes. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Can you write an inspirational self-help book that is just specific to seating on planes? Well, I don't know. Like I, 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 I have 17 chapters. <laughs> I do try to I do have a mindset where I this is not always obviously the case, but I try to get a lot out of out of the hour, out of the moment. So, like, you know, when I'm with the girls in the car, I make sure I, I try to engage them. I try to have something good happen there. I'm, I, I, I like I'm focused on. On making a good thing maybe yeah. happen. It, it doesn't, obviously it backfires and sometimes it's manipulative or something, but I, t- I try to have that mindset, I guess, especially with my family. Speaking of which, I'm sorry, since you brought up your daughters, can I bring up your errant text that you sent? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My Is that something goodness. I can well, mention I mean, on the air? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so Ophira and Pete and I are texting mm-hmm. about get, gathering today to chat with you fine listeners. And uh, Pete just sends some random, uh, <laughs> very mansplainy uh, historical <laughs> fact. Uh, I'll, I'll I know. It. I'll read it. It he was says, just, uh, it's mis- can you just add in a well, actually, at the beginning? To get it, to see <laughs> it's implied. It's implied. Okay. It says, yes, because four times in our history, including twice in the past two decades, the candidate who won the most popular votes did not become president. Uh, and I thought like, oh, Pete's having some very pedantic conversation with somebody who probably already knows this. <laughs> but uh, but apparently not. No, nope. this was a helpful thing you were doing because you were helping your daughter cheat on a test. Explain yourself, Peter. Yeah. Um, and why are you allowed phones during a test? What kind yeah. of school is this person in? So so it wasn't it wasn't cheating during a test. She had class time to work on an essay and she asked me a specific question rather than looking it up. I wrote to you guys that she was cheating because I wanted to impress the older kids. I think that you sent it to us because you know, deep down inside, this is wrong and it's kind of eating you up. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. and there's no inspirational message sit beside you. Uh, we're sitting beside you now on this plane, and I'm I'm going to set you straight. Stop all. doing that. Stop doing that. You know what? You write back. Look it up. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, there isn't a great situation where you accidentally text the, the wrong person, much less in this case, two people. It doesn't usually it's it's I the worst thing, I suppose, is is, is writing anything and, and accidentally texting someone you haven't talked to in years, because then sure. that's even yeah. more upset. So I'm glad right. it was the two of you. And I don't. I don't have any regrets. It was, you know, you're, you're reading into until, it. Which is, until it's like she gets kidnapped and they're say, we'll let you go if you can tell us how many times <laughs> the president has received fewer votes than the challenger. And she never learned that information on her own. That's so right. She has nothing to fall back on. And then, you know. Yeah. You. And wait till she gets everything wrong on that whatever exam that she's not pretending to do in class time, blah, blah, blah. Except for that one thing. And then someone takes her aside and goes, how did you know this one thing? What is she going to say? This is my specific area of interest. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me you don't text your son any answers ever. My son is six. Whatever. Let's <laughs> move. Cow goes moo. I did, though, this morning see him in his uh, he goes to an arts based school and they had a performance like a show. Of dancing oh, yeah. and singing. Oh yeah! Did he perform? Oh, those are he the, did. How old is he? Six. It He's is in grade one. Before you say anything, I want to just liberate you to say to, to, to say it is the worst possible <laughs> thing you've ever seen, and every, all the parents just looking at each other like, "Oh, it's horrible! It's horrible!" Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Although I will say this is an arts based school, so oh. some of the kids oh, are wow. either they're already involved in dance classes and music classes. Uh, but my son is really into um, and I have ju he's just into sports and like wrestling and punching things and and karate, honestly. So violence, he looked so he looks so bored on stage. He looks so bored. And at first I was panicking, like, oh, my goodness, all of the other parents are going to see that every other child is like performing. And my mm -hmm. kid looks bored. And then, you know what? My next thought was Pete Dominic and Christian Finnegan fellow performers i thought wait a second what if my kid doesn't want to perform and then the greatest sense of love and relief <laughs> and redemption washed over me i'll show I you thought, mom what? i'm gonna become an accountant <laughs> yeah. i thought what a wonderful thing it would be if he does not enjoy well, this i can oh my God, the, what's worse than that is what what is what would be worse than him wanting to do comedy or be a performer is what happened is 10. I have to have this conversation with her about once a year. My 14 year old Julia wants to be something far worse, which is uh, um, to, mo to model. She wants to model. And I say, no, mm -hmm. no, no. Right. Yeah. yeah that's, it's a, that's a tough road. It's nope. a tough road. Yeah. Uh, I'm the only whatever. one who can do modeling. I mean, I, I feel like whatever, I mean, just Instagram is hard enough on 14 year old mm -hmm. girls. I can't imagine just taking that up right. another level. Right. And I will say that that every person I've known, and it's only been like two or three in my entire life who has made a living as a professional model. Someone approached them and said, you need to model like and because they yeah. haven't been the most attractive. I remember there's this girl who went to like my junior high and she was just really tall and gangly. Yeah. Right. Because you're uh, like a hanger. I would never have thought of her as being like particularly attractive or whatever. But someone like approached her in a mall, a mall and said, you, I am going to sign like, I, well, I'm going to yes, send you out but, on auditions. But that's but they approach everyone now. There's a whole photography scam. Like yeah, I do a bit about is. it in my act yeah. because at the the mall, they stop every kid and you're watching them. You're like some of these kids. You're like, I mean, listen, I'm not trying to be. <laughs> Not everyone's fit for every job. Kid Let's has one that. eye. <laughs> <laughs> that well, could be a, a maybe. whole thing. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you don't think the, eyepatches .com needs models? Uh oh, yeah. folks. Christian Ophira, uh, we have a hot tweet alert. Hot tweet alert. Oh, this week. Okay. Alert. Yes. This week, uh, at Christ Finnegan <laughs> had a tweet absolutely blow up. Oh, wow. Whoa. Let's talk about it. Hot tweet alert is brought to you by. Our comedy tour. Um, so uh, David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, celebrated conservative New York Times columnist, tweeted, I fell in love with conservatism as a young man. 
What the hell happened to it? And he linked to an article in The Atlantic. And Christian Finnegan quote tweeted, are you ready to read it or should I hit it? You can go ahead. Oh, oh, I know this one. Your mythical conservatism is a niche brand of elite narcissism incapable of winning national elections. So you used evangelicals, racist gun nuts as electoral foot soldiers. But then, whoops, they became self-aware and realized they don't need you. David Brooks. I added the David Brooks. Yeah. Hot tweet. What? It is on fire at this uh, at this airing at 10,000 likes two and a half thousand RTs. This is what we call folks. A hot tweet. Finnegan. Virality, baby. What do you want to say? And waiting for that money to roll in <laughs> any day now. <laughs> you get like you get 10 bucks per retweet, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah I think so. Yeah. I yeah it gets matched. It goes, goes into escrow. First time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's uh, a, it's a great yeah. tweet. Thank you. I appreciate that. It is. It's a, I loved it. I, when I saw that, I sometimes do you ever think about retweeting things? I'm a big retweeter of other people's thoughts. And that's basic uh, my entire career. But I <laughs> you ever think about it? I didn't think about it. I was like, oh, yes. Share this one with everybody. That's hot take. I like it a lot. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, as is the case every time. And it's only happened maybe seven or eight times over the course of Twitter that I've had a treat. A, a tweet uh or is it a treat it, it is a tweet treat it, it's, it's a tweet treat it's a treat uh every time something's gone viral i end up like super resenting it and mm. don't really enjoy the ex- sorry uh don't really enjoy the experience why 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 because your phone is just constantly like you're getting all these notifications and you're getting like comments it starts going out to people. This one honestly was was less bad than past ones. I didn't get as many people trying to like argue with me or fight right. me. It was mostly it was mostly kind of the the Krasenstein follower crowd kind of uh do you know what I'm talking about? Like it's such a there, weird... there, there is kind of an industry of of kind of liberal retweeters yeah. that that grates yeah. on me just a hair. Uh, uh, I just got to It's again, I just got to jump in to say how different we are. If I had a tweet that hot, I would cancel plans with my daughters to just sit and watch it. <laughs> yeah, I would take a, I would like do the screenshot and then put it on the Instagram, share it to the stories, perhaps like talk about it in a reels. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why I'm the worst, because uh, I've done none of that. But at the same time, I know exactly how many faves it has. So it's like I'm not even above it, but I'm also not taking advantage of it. So I know the whole point, as we all know, to these social media platforms is their whole point is to keep you on it for as long as possible. Right. That's like Mm -hmm. that's the 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 point of um, Twitter existing. So if you just tweet out your thought and then, yeah, you can idly watch it, but you never look at the comments. You don't respond. Zero. Is it is that a way to I don't know, have power over it? Instead of like, I know what you're saying, because then you have all these responses. It's going to be all over the place because that's how social media goes. Some of it's going to be really brutal. Some of it is going to be uh, on the right side of history, but not what you were aiming at. And then everything in between. Well, and like, like, luckily, like I said, this one hasn't been as bad. Last one that this happened was like a uh, a couple months ago or when Britney Spears got her freedom or whatever. And I tweeted a dumb Britney Spears joke. And it went sort of viral. And all these people started getting into arguments with each other in my the best way. Comments. The best way. Sure. You know, and it's com- I'm completely divorced from this conversation that people are having. And I find that very unpleasant. Um, if a tweet doesn't start a boxing match, I think it's not worth anything. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, I, I mean, it's fascinating to talk about our, all, all of this in terms of how we feel about social media in general. But I would love to just ask one question about that tweet, because the way I see it, there are these so many kind of moderate, you know, thoughtful, to some extent, conservatives from Russ Douthat to, to David Brooks or even like somebody like uh, on Fox News, like Brett Baer or somebody that was in Congress, Republican that was thought of as moderate, even though maybe you didn't think that way, being eaten alive by the road they've been laying down and it's Mm -hmm. happens over and over. And I wonder if you have one of your snappy metaphors for some kind of hungry, hungry (laughs) hippo just devouring them, but they lay this ground and then they're like, what happened? And it outrages me, which is why I fell in love with that tweet. 
Uh, well, now I have all this pressure to find a snappy metaphor. Now don't. I have nothing. Yeah, just come up with it. Me. No, write it quickly. It's like you put crocodiles in your own moat, and then you're mad that you can't swim in it. He did it. He did it. <gasps> well done. Does that, does that he work? did it. Does that work? I don't did know. It. I, I, it had feudal undertones too. I enjoy that. <laughs> Thank you. Feudal undertones. Your own my moat. Cologne that I've, I've created. <laughs> Uh, do you have any? Do you, either of you have any any further thoughts on that tweet, which I think is a really big, uh, thoughtful, important issue? But otherwise, I'll move on. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a I it's a slightly simplistic view of things, I guess. But I don't think really. I think that's kind of you know, I, I just the, the the sort of pearl clutching and the the sort of uh, willful obtuseness on the part of the David Brookses of the world. That like, you know, you know what you were doing, you know, like yeah. your brand of sort of rich guy, Wall Street, like, oh, you know, uh, oblige, noblesse, you know, uh, the, this idea that like, you know, we rich people have to calm down. We have to slow down progress for the good of everyone. That sort of bat packy, narcissistic horseshit that the David Brooks is the world tell themselves. It's like, you know, that that wasn't going to win you even a, a local town council seat without the sort of electoral oomph of the the local idiots and racists. And so you you sort of held your nose yep. for a long time or just told yourself that you were different as you made common cause with these people who you knew are volatile and uh, a, a problem and fascist leaning. And so I just don't I don't buy your like I was just in it for the intellectualism. It's like, well, no one. You know, sorry that it, uh, Skynet became self-aware and I <laughs> <laughs> don't need you. I guess it's like the same thing people used to say about uh, Playboy magazine just over and over and over again. <laughs> I only what, did they, what did they, wait, what did, I'm, I didn't get that. Oh, just that it would always like all these guys be like, I read it for the articles. It was oh, like the yeah. biggest joke, right? And it's yeah. just like the same thing. It's like, no, no, no. We know exactly what you're doing and then they tried to to get nudity out of playboy a few years ago remember they said there are a couple of years yes ago, and, it, and it lasted like six weeks and they're like oh yeah forget we said that yeah but that's a tough yeah, rebranding that's a tough rebranding. you got it i mean you got to feel for them that's the uh, kind of what well, it is it does have to be weird to be playboy where it's just like you know the nudity really is quaint and hilarious at this point it's like right oh wow like she, she's coquettishly you know topless or whatever it's like dude i can go on my phone and see like Four women have sex with a donkey like now what's that so, like again right and then you can just pick who what you're just like can, i don't want i want to see one with redheads yes yeah exactly i mean <laughs> just to mix it up <laughs> you, you, uh barnyard wardello great site barnyard wardello okay. uh you know what they should do you know those like um those flip books that's mm -hmm. what they should do to playboy to spice it up yeah, you have to, they have to flip the pages of the magazine. Flip the pages really to see the animation happen of see the a woman nudity. On a trampoline. Um, <laughs> I wanted to. I also wanted to ask you both where you were and how you felt when you saw that Christmas tree go up in flames in front of Fox News. I mean, it was kind of like you know the day you found out someone was assassinated. Do you remember where you were when you saw <laughs> that tree aflame? Didn't you, Ophira? You don't know about it. No, I guess that was when uh, I was at a Jewish laser meeting and we were like, uh oh. Oh, yeah, that oh, was this week. The coordinates were off. <laughs> we got the Flax Christmas tree. Exactly. Whoopsie. Yeah. Try again, everybody. I mean, not bad. High fives. We were trying to get an <laughs> SMBC. And it... uh, my favorite, uh, I think, joke was that apparently uh, a bunch of Fox News viewers thought it was a cross. <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that is, it's just the war on Christmas, right? Is that it? Was it to symbolize well, I mean, the war on acting, Christmas? I mean, they're acting, you know, I, I haven't seen it, but just on scrolling Twitter and videos yeah. where people are posting of, of the anchors, they're acting like it was like the night of broken glass. Like they're acting <laughs> like it was this massive, tragic event yeah. that will anal like ring through history. The day the Fox Christmas tree was set on fire and what is happening to the city and our urban centers are overrun by chaos. Like, yeah. Right. Or, uh, know, and now they have footage for years, like every uh, December, whatever, 11th, they're going to be like, remember this, everybody. Let's never forget. Yeah. I thought it was great that it was the fire revealed that it wasn't actually a tree. It yes. was just a metal frame with some just crap on it. Yeah. So that was <laughs> take that as metaphor as you will. 
It was like the tree from Bethlehem, okay? They didn't have all the fancy stuff, Christian. Well, meanwhile, fancy, inside no, in, in, meanwhile, inside the building, Fox News superstar Tucker Carlson was trying to convince his right-wing counterpart in the UK, Nigel Farage, that COVID, getting hmm. COVID, steals your life force and seems to feminize men. Have you heard about this? Feminize men? Yes. All right. Well, how do we order it then? Can we just <laughs> bottle it? <laughs> well, the, I, I haven't watched the segment. I won't watch it in all likelihood. But it's like, well, then shouldn't you want to not get it then? Yeah, that should like, be like that should be the greatest thing to get people vaccinated. Yeah. Well, I mean, because I, I do think that there are erectile dysfunction issues with some right. men who get COVID, which is probably kind of in a roundabout way what he's talking about. But it's like, so so then. So you don't want masks, you know, you don't think people should have to get vaccinated, but it, COVID is also a plot to feminize men. Like, like the, the, the sort of tent posts that they lay out are so contradictory. There's just no ideal, ideological consistency to any of the arguments. It's almost like they're full of shit. Almost, but to employ the uh, unbelievable optimism and spin that I'm slowly learning from Pete Dominic, let's take a win out of this. They admit COVID exists. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, it's, it now exists and is doing something. I had a less, I had a less a smart take, which was <laughs> that I, I, I feel like, you know, what's it called? Man flu or man sick? Like when men get sick, they, they act like a lot weaker or wusses. Babies. Right. Like, I think that's a thing. I think I do that. Like my wife, like I, I I'm pretty bad when I'm sick. And that, I guess, is equated. Maybe, maybe that's what they mean, that when we get sick, we act really kind of weak because we do. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Maybe that's right. what they mean. All right. Well, I'm gonna whatever wrap it is, I just like that. Whatever. Uh, whatever is. All, I love that feminine is always associated with weakness. Keep going, everybody. Right. Yeah. right. Keep going. Right. No problem. So thank you both very much. Um, I, I want to wish you the best of uh, luck this week, Ophira, on your trip to uh, Portland, thanks. Oregon, a big gig out there. And and Christian, I know you're getting some dental work this week. So good luck. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. With that. I know. And you're going to be my guinea pig because if you like it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Oh, we, we, hey. we t- oh. <laughs> um, wait, uh, before I go, I want to say that I did Ophira's uh, Jeopardy show uh, last week at Littlefield, oh, which is her so incredibly legally unsanctioned uh, game show. <laughs> based on a popular TV show you may have heard of. Uh, it was the most fun I've had on stage in easily since before the pandemic started. Oh, wow. And I include the tape of my own special. It was such a good time. Is it, it uh, exist? You were awesome. By the way, Christian won. I did. Can big come Unsurprised. Back. Unsurprised. Yeah. That's why I don't want to do, we were talking about things we could do on our, our, our dates and like, mention like maybe some kind of trivia thing, like, and you host it and it's me versus Christian. I'm like, I'm, I'm good. Like why don't no? Why doesn't well, it be? No, you, and also this, though, I have a hard time. Like, he'll Ophira's be funny show was and fun smart, and, and I'll the, be the less. The trivia part of it was kind of superfluous. I mean, it was more about the jokes and having fun and stuff. But if it's like a real trivia contest, I almost lose my ability to have a sense of humor because there's a part of me that's like, I must win the trivia. Right. Well, okay. But then because I'll I'm go, not a real man, and this is no. Let me show. host your trivia, Pete, because I like doing what we did in the show, like true or false. Like we do true or false. We did real or we did real or fake Hallmark movies. And you know what? Yeah. This was the audience got really drunk in, in the intermission and came back. They were the rowdiest, happiest nerds I've seen in a long time. Mm-hmm. And we ran out of time and had to go to final Jeopardy. And there were still two clues left in the real or fake Hallmark category. And people in the audience revolted and made us finish that category. That is amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Very Does it exist? Is there a recording? Yeah, there, I have it on my phone, which is actually pretty good. It's almost like having a real camera. I, I want to, uh, I want to, are you going to, can, no, but can we watch it? Can we listen to it? Is that, yeah, I know there's yeah, one yeah, clip yeah. that was floating around on Instagram. Oh, but, yeah, uh, we put out, really we had a live uh, music act, Rachel Price uh, and That's Taylor awesome. Aston from Lake Street Dive did one of the clues and uh, they sang a rendition. Uh, it was finished the lyrics and they sang, uh, All I Want for Christmas is You and Christian and the other two comics just naturally became backup singers to the and the audience too to the point where people came up to me after the show and asked me how long we rehearsed it 
And I was like, no, 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 that just happened. <laughs> And the spirit, the, the Christmas That's spirit. so great. <laughs> that is so great. And I, I hope that you're going to continue to do that or something like it or develop it. And uh, oh, you're going to be on it. Be I, careful. I don't know. That was, can, can I do it from the shed? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, let's go to the jerk shed now where Pete Dominic <laughs> is. All right. We'll talk to you guys next week. I hope. Thank you very much. Brutals. Thank you. All right, there they go. Ophira Eisenberg, Christian Finnegan, at Ophira E, at Christian, uh, rather, Christ Finnegan on Twitter. And let them know that you heard them here. January 15th, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. January 16th, Stone Harbor, New Jersey. And January 22nd at the Beacon. And I'll have links in the show notes for tickets. And I hope to see you at one of those shows. Okay, well, now it's time to get to my second and final guest of the week. Very excited to have her back on the show. Super smart woman doing amazing work along with several of her colleagues and friends at an amazing organization called Sister District at Sister underscore District on Twitter, by the way, SisterDistrict.org, which she's the co-founder of. Their mission is to build progressive power in state legislatures. And she's also a bioethics lawyer and health policy researcher and has a PhD in health policy from University of California, Berkeley. I'm really happy to have her back on the show to talk about what she witnessed and experienced at the Supreme Court. She was there last week with Liz Winstead, who also joined me this week. Clearly, this is an important issue to me, and I hope that it is to you. But the way forward for women's reproductive rights, Gabby Goldstein joins me. You can follow her on Twitter as well, at Gabby with one B-Y underscore Goldstein. Let's do it. All right, I've got Gabby Goldstein back again. I really like talking to her. I love her organization, and I specifically think their focus is the focus that matters because it's specific, and I think it's sustainable and long-term. And uh, we're talking about all kinds of issues regarding women's, uh, women's rights. So thank you, Gabby, for joining me again. Happy to be here, Pete. Thank you. So you were uh, down, you were in D.C. You were at the Supreme Court during oral arguments. Was it last week uh, uh, on the uh, latest on the Mississippi uh, case when it comes to abortion? And I wanted you to kind of lay that out for me, how, how you saw that day and, 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 and why you were there and however you want to answer it in terms of where we're going after that, after that you heard the arguments that day. Yeah, so I live here in D.C. and um, take every opportunity I can to walk down to the mall or the Supreme Court and just be visible and present uh, during important events and and actions. So it was um, really important for me to walk down to the Supreme Court before oral arguments started in the Dobbs case last week. This, of course, is the, the case that's pending in the Supreme Court dealing with the constitutionality of a Mississippi law from 2018 that essentially bans abortions after the first 15 weeks of pregnancy. Um, of course, that is a lot longer than other states have now put their ban into place. Texas, of course, being a, a state that has banned abortion at six weeks plus a snitch bounty. Um, so, uh, and the Supreme Court hasn't blocked that case. So that that ban is, is currently in effect in Texas. Um, but this Supreme Court case that's pending at the, at, at, that's pending now is, um, you know, seen by many as the, the case that is likely to either overturn Roe v. Wade or really, really limit it. And um, it's, it is part of a broader conservative strategy in jurisprudence and in general to narrow the federal protections that the Constitution allows and, and gives us and to expand states' rights. That is a long-term project of movement conservatism and, and conservatives. Um, and this case is just one in a long legacy of cases where conservative courts um, are curtailing our federal rights and giving more power to states to decide really important issues. Yeah, it's so much about the courts. It's so much about the judges on those courts. And then beyond that, it's so much about the activism that got those judges on those courts, including, you know, getting President Trump elected and Mitch McConnell reelected so he could do what he did. And you've got three new justices uh, appointed to the Supreme Court by Donald Trump. And I just wanted to get a word on that in terms of the percentage of Americans uh, in terms of uh, attitudes towards abortion, women's reproductive rights in general, who I think the specific question has to be, 
think even though even if they hate abortion and they're against abortion, still think that it should be legal. I think that's where we get uh, cons- uh, get it wrong on the polling question. So the percentage of Americans that think abortion should be legal versus what this court I- I- is deciding is really out of balance, is my understanding. Fair to say? Yes, absolutely. A majority of Americans, a healthy majority of Americans think that abortion should be legal. What we have is a conservative movement that has engineered their way into being insulated from public opinion. That's that is the consequence of gerrymandering in Congress. We have extreme polarization both in our state houses and in Congress that allows politicians to be insulated from what their voters actually want. And it's also the consequence of a long term project on the right to to train and install conservative judges its state level and the federal level, which are also insulated from the public's opinion. Um, So we have systems of government that are fully captured by ideologues that do not at all match the preferences of voters. And those, this situation is created because of conservative activism, anti-abortion activism. They call it pro-life. I don't. And you and your organization, Sister District, sisterdistrict.com, donate now, are the opposition to that. You are organizing and you're doing it now for 2022. Gabby, I wanted to take some time off. And apparently the message is we don't get we don't really get time time off. No, there's no time off. Sorry, not sorry. It's all hands on deck. Um <laughs> Yes. So my organization, my co-founders and I started this organization with the goal of building progressive power in state legislatures. We saw this as a critically overlooked venue of power for progressives. Um, State legislatures are our policy pipeline, our leadership pipeline. Half of all members of Congress started in their state ledge, and they are critically important, vital keys to fair districts, voting rights, repro justice issues. Um, Let's remember that gerrymandering is a creature of state law. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Doesn't come from Congress, doesn't come from the president. It comes from state legislatures. So we really wanted to focus on building power at this level of the ballot. We always say, I hate to say that, that progressives are tardy to the party when it comes to paying attention to state legislatures. The conservative movement has been at this game for decades decades and decades, they realized long ago that state legislatures are extremely important. These are cheap races. They toil in obscurity. No one pays any attention to them. And they're really easy to pick off if you're a Republican. So they've been at this game for decades and we're really coming from behind. Um, And, you know, there are, I was saying before, there are these broader trends in, in the courts Um, and in in regulation and all sorts of things that are limiting federal protections and giving more power back to states. So it's at this critical point that we really have to invest in our state legislatures, uh, which is what my organization does. And yeah, that's exactly right. No off years. Um, Next year is, let's just say, one other thing about state legislatures that I think it's kind of an emerging issue. Enough but People are not talking about this enough. Um, this is something that um, Dave Daly and I wrote about a few months ago um, for Salon, which is there is this legal theory called the Independent State Legislatures Doctrine, which is a legal, a conservative hatched legal theory that's been making its way through the courts that essentially says that the Constitution, the federal Constitution, gives state legislatures, the sole authority, the sole authority to decide election law and declare victors of election. And this theory, they are teeing it up for 2024 so that conservative state legislatures in places like Wisconsin and Arizona 
and Pennsylvania can decide who the winner is of the 2024 presidential election, regardless of the votes in those states. Yes, yes. And, We've, and, I've and talked about you, that um, yeah. on, on the show with uh, constitutional law scholar Eric Siegel and Dave Daly is is awesome. I'm, I'm psyched to hear that you guys are. I'll go look at that column and share it. But I, and I interrupted you. But it's such a scary and important point because why? Because that means that the will of the people will be 100 percent jettisoned, disregarded, set aside, and the interests of the Republicans will be the only thing guiding who ends up in the White House in 2024. And next year, 2022, is our last chance to elect Democrats to state legislatures to block this from happening. This is an existential moment that you probably had this a similar conversation with the, the law professor that you just mentioned, the, the legal scholar. This is our last chance before 24. 2022 is our last chance to change the composition of state legislatures before they will essentially get to decide. Yeah. They'll try to decide the 2024 and, presidential and, election. And we just heard from the guy who lost his Senate race but is now running for governor to primary a, 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 a guy who's already a Trumper. This is just so insane. But David Perdue running to primary Brian Kemp in Georgia. And, and he said in an interview, I think, yesterday he would not have voted to confirm the election uh, of 2020, which is what you're talking about. Like if he were governor, he would not have been, you know, I'm not sure how much power the governor has versus the legislature, but it's it's he's saying that right now it's a hypothetical, but it's a really important point. Let me go back to another point that you made, though, in terms of state elections are cheap. And my understanding is. The right in special interests on the right and in organizations like the Koch brothers and Alec and others have been spending lots of money on these cheap state legislatures. Whereas on the on the left or on the progressive movement, we don't even really have that kind of money because it's corporate money more than anything else. And we're like, you know, trying to advocate for poor people or the environment or issues that don't have like a lot of corporate money behind them and, and these fancy fundraisers just always been the case. It probably always will be the case. So am I right to say how the money has gotten to those state races on the right? And how do we get that money to state races in the progressive movement? I'm pulling down one of my very favorite, extremely dog eared books that I have read, read uh, probably half a dozen times, which is Dark Money by Jane Mayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, highly recommend if folks have not read this book extremely, extremely important book that basically goes through the history of how we ended up in this situation where the conservatives have this very streamlined, very well orchestrated set of institutions that fund and support conservative judges and candidates and causes. And on the other hand, the, the progressives have a much larger and more diffuse set of institutions. And in many ways, this is great, right? A thousand flowers bloom. We have yeah. fantastic issue advocacy organizations that are working so hard on particular issues and all the rest. But it creates a coordination problem on our side um, that makes resource allocation um, just much more um, diffuse, right? Versus what happens on the right, which is extremely streamlined, really just a, a big handful of very rich uh, family foundations and corporate interests control the political strategy on the right. And that's a very effective strategy for them. So Sister District is doing what specifically uh, on, on on what issues? I mean, because you just you know laid it out perfectly in terms of how diffuse we are. What are the issues that your organization is focused on and what is the strategy uh, between now and 2022 elections? Yeah. So we focus exclusively on state legislatures. As I mentioned, you know, this is a very, very overlooked venue of power and um, it's a great return on investment for volunteer time and and donations um, and all the rest. And so um, we do this through we have a network of over 60,000 volunteers across the country. And each year we endorse a set of state legislative candidates in key critical battleground chambers. And we help them win through field and fundraising and um, professional services that we provide. 
Um, and in addition to that field and fundraising candidate facing work, we also work directly with progressive state legislators once they're elected to make sure that they have the resources that they need to um, to be successful, including the only national we run the only national network of purple district uh, state legislators, progressives, so folks in frontline seats who have flipped their seats from red to blue or who just won by just a little bit. Uh, so we have a network of those folks who are able to come together and share best practices, ideas around policy, governance, um, really try to create some uh, community so that we can exchange good information across states from, from the legislator perspective. So we're trying to attack this on uh, from, from different angles, both helping folks get elected and then helping folks, great, diverse, progressive state legislators succeed once they're in office. And next year is going to be a real battle. I mean, we know that um, historically speaking, the presidential party does not do well in the midterm elections, right? That's just a, a, a historical fact, which means that the enthusiasm and the motivation of the out party, the party that's not in the White House, tends to be bigger during midterms. And um, that's what we're fighting against next year. So yeah. when you said you hope to take some time off, no, no, my friend, next year we have to out enthusiasm, out motivate the Republicans if we want to hold on to the House and if we want to hold on to and grow power in our state legislatures. Again, last chance on state legislatures before the 2024 election. You know, it seems like these the argument last week at the Supreme Court, you know, Brett Kavanaugh, who shouldn't be on the court, you know, made this long argument about precedent and how the Supreme Court is overturned, which is different than what he said in his confirmation hearing. But how the Supreme Court over uh, history has overturned so many cases. But the difference here, of course, is this is this would be taking a right away versus giving a right. And I think that. I don't know. You and I are probably around the same age ish and growing up in America in the, in the last 30 or 40 years, you know, we overwhelmingly had more rights as at least women did when it came to reproductive rights. We were gaining rights during during our lifetime to see my daughters, um, um, this generation of women or, or humans in America losing rights, for, you know, putting aside reproductive rights for a second, voting rights, the fact that we're losing rights is as a result of a long, long, hard-fought strategy on the right in many different ways. So the question is, in terms of, like, timeline, Gabby, we, we kind of have to, we have to be this, we have to be in this for our life. I didn't want to be fighting to keep rights we already won. I wanted to fight to keep gaining more rights. But it's just so frustrating to get set back, given what I said in terms of context about our lifetime and, and rights in general. But that's what we're talking about. We're in this for 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 the rest of our lives at this point, based on elections and timelines and, and the current paradigm, it would seem. Yeah, uh, a million percent. I mean, the conservative strategy can be uh, reduced to two words, right? Government bad. Government. Yes. Bad. What are yes, our two yes, words? Yes, like yes. not not exactly sure what our two words are, but that's it. Government bad. And one way government bad is the <laughs> idea of strong federal rights. And so the civil rights movement and all of the, the, the legislation that came out of that was really an effort to expand federal rights, right, to, to interpret our Constitution in a way that is most inclusive and most expansive. And the conservative strategy has been since and even before and since, to narrow and narrow and narrow what the federal rights are that we have, the, the interpretation of our Constitution right. in a narrow way. And so that's that's what we're fighting against. And it is um, it, it is a long, long strategy, and it's taken them many decades to, to really see this come to fruition, especially now with the composition of the Supreme Court. Um, the other thing I would just say is that on our side, this is something that beloved, beloved progressive messaging expert Anat Shankar Asario says all the time. If you haven't had her on your show, you should. She's a delight and she's a beloved in progressive messaging. What she always says is we can't just be against deplorable stuff. 
we have to be for stuff too, right? We can't just be against what the conservatives are doing. We can't just be against Donald Trump. We can't, but we have to have an expansive, beautiful vision of the world that would happen if we had power. And I think that something that's a bee in my bonnet and something that I'm really focused on is building the case for a progressive federalism. The idea that states' rights can be good for people too. They don't, you know, states have a lot of power and we have to learn to tell the story about the great things that states can and do do. And the good news is there's lots of great stuff that states are doing in the areas of, of expanding reproductive justice uh, issues, um, environment, you know, um, uh, any anything, education, etc. cetera. Um, but this is a gap in our narrative that progressives have to start filling, is creating a good vision of the world that would happen if we did have control of more state legislatures and if we did have progressive policies coming from our states. Um, so that's just the other piece in the long-term, thinking long-term. We have to be in this forever. There is no finish line. And in addition to being fighting back against what the conservatives are doing, we also have to present this this beautiful vision of the world um, that, that can and will happen when we have power. Who is that person? The Schenkers. Oh, and I'm not Schenker Asario. Uh, she's, she's absolutely fantastic. She has a podcast called uh, words that win, and she works a lot with progressive um, with the progressive movement on messaging strategy. Awesome. And she's uh, yeah, she's great. Highly recommend having her on to talk messaging. I will. I will. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, joining me to talk about all of your work at Sister District. Um, any, any kind of uh, action item you want to leave me and listeners with? Yeah, please outside join of us. donating to this great nonprofit, SisterDistrict.com and, and joining their fight. Yes, uh, it's a great time to join us. We have over 150 teams across the country, and um, so we probably have one near you. And our teams, um, you know, obviously pandemic world, but they get together and uh, either by Zoom or, you know, hopefully again in person uh, to make phone calls, hold fundraisers for our candidates, write postcards, send text messages, all of that good stuff to help elect wonderful progressive uh, candidates for state ledge who are building towards a reflective democracy that we want to see. Um, so we would love to have you join us. It's a great time to get involved. And as I said, next year is absolutely critical. We have to we have to spare a thought for state ledge, uh, given how much attention and focus will be put on federal races and uh, gubernatorial races, which, of course, very, very important. But in our in our volunteering portfolio, let's all make a little bit of room for state ledge. A little bit goes a long way at this level of the ballot. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I'm also myself trying to talk with more uh, current policymakers in, in at the state level. I'm, I'm going to be joined by a Michigan state legisature named uh, uh, Senator McMorrow over the oh, weekend. Mallory. We love Mallory. Yeah, you She's know, a Mallory, sister district I think, alum. Oh, yeah, I, I, she came I, through our program. I wasn't sure if she did or not, so I didn't. I, I just thought of it um, as you're talking there. But but send me anybody else um, that's currently you know working in government because I think part of that message that you think needs to be sent, which I agree with, I think that's a great a, a, a great way of saying it is is talking to people actually doing the work right now. And so you know th those people don't get nearly enough media coverage in their own districts, states, much less nationally. So. I'm always happy to talk with with any of these folks and uh, and and hopes that they will. So definitely send them my way. And Gabby, thank you, as always, for, for joining me. You're such a smart, passionate, inspiring leader and your organization is amazing. I'm really, really glad whenever I get to talk to you. Thanks, Pete. OK, well, there you have it. Christian Finnegan and Ophira Eisenberg. Oh, Finnegan, as well as Gabby Goldstein at Sister District. And that is all I've got for you today and this week. I hope you have a great weekend. I appreciate you tuning in whenever you did. Download the podcast this week. Listen to it. Tell your friends. Write a recommendation on Apple Podcasts, a review, if you will. And if you're not already a subscriber, would love to have you sign up. Just go to standupwithpete.com right now or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Great to hang out with everybody last night. The subscribers who did show up. We had a great conversation. And I hope you have a great, great weekend. John Carroll, take us out right now, please. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, 
with other causes for laws and sins that weren't even sin. They knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it is time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. Experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no one and try and rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up.